All right, ladies. Well, we are in chapter four, about midway through. We're going to be on page 70, just quickly picking up there. And that is on the let the women be likable and loving. And the first thing I would want to point out as we get into this portion of our study is that there is a necessity of our faith, which is right and true knowledge. And I think that's oftentimes lost in the world in which we live is this idea that that the pursuit of knowledge or the pursuit of knowing something is worthwhile and excellent. And and yet that's the essence of who we are. Uh, The author has broken down some very specific areas that we need to to rightly view, uh, to rightly understand uh, for us to be able to experience the life that he has created for us. He begins with, and again, it's just working through. We already covered this. I'm just going to hit it very quickly and roll into where we're at. But understanding God's purpose for marriage. And what happens when we don't know something that we're forced to be in the midst of? Right? Has anyone ever had a situation like that where, where you have to do something, but you just don't know what it is you're supposed to do, but you have to do something? How does that usually go? You learn some hard lessons usually through those things and you're better prepared for the next, but it never goes well. And so there's a measure of if we don't know what it is that God's given us to know in regards to the things that we're called to do, things such as marriage, things such as parenting, things such as pursuing Christ in our life, uh, serving the church, whatever that looks like. If we don't know, what do we tend to do? What's the human response to things that we don't know? but have to do what is it we frown upon it it. this is true but even more than that the scary part of it is that we make it up as we go right we start making it up as we go and because of pride and other things we tend to then consider that what we've made up is right and whatever the outcomes are aren't really our fault and so it's a dangerous pathway that we don't have to walk the lord's been kind to give us his mind. That's how scripture describes itself, that we have this gift of the, the mind of, of Christ that's been given to us. And so we don't have to make it up as we go. One of the things that I would encourage you ladies, as I encourage our men in these things, is that we have to know what we know. In other words, when you think about that, do you know what you believe? In all things, do you know what you believe. If someone were to ask you, well, what's your view on abortion? Would you be able to give a biblical response to this is what I believe about this very big subject that exists in our world? If someone asks you, well, what, what do you, what do you believe about marriage in uh, the issues of same sex marriage or is marriage important? Many, many people today are choosing not to get married. So marriage is a very hot button topic of our generation. And I'm curious, and again, not looking for a response from you, but I want you to think through, do you know what you believe about marriage? Or do you just know, well, I know that same sex marriage is wrong, but do you know what you actually believe about it? And so in the same way, we could look, for example, at at the gospel. Do you know what you believe about the gospel? And you might say, well, that's a pretty basic topic, right? That's a, that's a foundational topic. That's one we ought to have nailed down. I agree. And yet, in our generation, how much confusion is there surrounding the gospel perpetrated most fully by those professing the gospel? Right? That's where the confusion comes in. The confusion's not by those who don't profess to believe the gospel. The confusion is always brought in by those who profess to believe it and then have very differing views upon it without coming together and saying, well, what does it actually say? And I'm constantly confronted with this in any time when I'm speaking to a professing Christian on an area of disagreement. You'll know pretty quickly. People ask me all the time, well, how do you know or what makes you convinced that you're right in this area of belief? Well, the answer is very simple. Number one, I want to be very humble in pursuing it, believing that I'm not perfect and therefore could be wrong, but knowing that God has given an answer. 
Therefore, it becomes a very simple task of considering <clears throat> what is the basis of this conversation or disagreement? Are they giving me experiential things? Are they giving me uh, historical things? Or are they giving me biblical things? Oftentimes, it will show itself in hopeful, historical, or experiential. Well, I don't know what God's word says about this, but I know what I've experienced. Okay, how dangerous is that statement? It's massively dangerous, and it's that type of thought that leads us down roads we had not ought to go. So that's a question I just want to give to you all. Do you, do you know what you believe? The Apostle Paul makes this statement at the beginning of the book of Galatians that he wants the church to know the gospel so well, so intimately, and so accurately that even if he loses his mind and comes back and tells them something different, or even if an angel were to come down from heaven and tell them something different, that that church would not be persuaded to be moved one inch from the gospel. Do you know the gospel? Do you, do you know what you believe about the gospel well enough that if an angelic being appeared to you and told you something different, you could firmly and steadfastly not be moved? That's the standard Paul holds up for the gospel. That it can't be distorted. So in the same way, when we consider biblical womanhood, when we consider marriage, when we consider what it means to love your husbands, to be likable and like your husbands, how much of what you believe or what you're acting on is based out of worldly knowledge, things that have been made up as it goes along, and how much of it is rooted and grounded that you can point to Scripture and say, in light of this, I believe these things. Such an important thing and it's such an essential component of who we are that we are those who, who our faith is a thinking faith. It's a faith that is rooted in knowledge uh, that, that has been given to us and handed down. So he gave us several points of understanding God's purpose for marriage. Again, just a reminder and a refresher as we hit these last week. Number one, God made males and females uniquely different. If there was ever a time when we would understand how important such a simple statement is, it would be in the generation in which we live. And here's the wonderful part. A believer rejoices in the differences. I'm constantly laboring in our men's lives to help them understand that we don't love our wives in spite of their differences. We love them because of their differences. <coughs> and it's not just the physical differences. It is the emotional and mental differences. Y'all think differently than us. You know you do. We know you do. And generally, a worldly view says that's because we're from different planets. And therefore, it's something that has to be recognized and then basically ignored as you do your own thing and try and make it all work together. Scripture teaches the exact opposite. It says that you merge together the distinctions into one unit that then functions in what's called biblical marriage. God made us different for, in many ways. Uh, marriage was designed originally by God to meet a problem for man. Uh, the author put loneliness. I, I like the word completion better. I think it more encapsulates what was going on in that scene in Genesis chapter 2. Uh, the third point, marriage was designed to bring happiness, not misery. That's a big one to nail down what we believe about. That we can trust God's good design because God's good design was never intended to harm. And is not still yet intended to harm. His design has been given for good. Right? Remember those truths about God. We're, we're told, for example, that God is one who, who is good and he only does good. Right? We're also told in Matthew 7 that we have a, a, a if, if our fathers being evil know how to give good gifts, how much more so does our heavenly father being perfect give good gifts to his children? So we have a heavenly father who gives good gifts to his children. And then thirdly, we have a heavenly father who's working all things together for good for those who are his children. And so when you look at the difficulties and other things, are you viewing it through the lens of who he is? Or are you finding yourself viewing him through the lens of who you are? And that gets real confusing really quick. And so just an important thing, marriage was designed uh, to bring happiness, not misery. It is a gift 
Uh, marriage is leaving, on page 72, other relationships to begin a new permanent relationship. This is the view of oneness. It's a view that has been abused throughout history. Uh, but it's such an important thing. It is to be the greatest relationship that you have. There is to be none greater in your life. Not your relationship with your career, not your relationship with your children, not your relationship with anything. Your marriage is to be the greatest relationship that you have. Uh, marriage requires an inseparable joining of a husband and wife until death. Uh, this begins in, in, at the basic level. It's not just, oh my goodness, we can never use the D word. Sadly, by the time you get to the place you're tempted to use the D word, you've already crossed a lot of lines you should have never crossed. And, and so it begins here. And I love the way the author puts it. A, a wife and husband commit to never say or do anything that would drive a wedge between them. I love that starting point. It's such a better starting point than I hear so often in Christian marriage counseling where it's like, okay, this is your never, you never get to use the D word, you know, divorce. Well, I want to start way back here. That's such a low standard that why would we ever look to that? Scripture certainly does not. <clears throat> and so we left off there. And I'm going to pick up at the bottom of page 72 for this week. Marriage means oneness in the fullest sense, including intimate physical union without shame. All right. So this is where an area that we can really examine and see what do we actually believe? Do we know what we believe about God's design for this? You see, we live in a world that has under the pretense of, of removing shame, has made God give, God's good gift of physical intimacy shameful and has done such perversity and harm and damage. And it has so easily crept into the church where there's so many differing views on it. Mm -hmm. And I deal oftentimes that, you know where I get to see these views most fully? In our teenagers, right? What they're thinking about this area is oftentimes a great reflection of the generation that's gone before them stop process in regards to these areas. And this is an area that is so confusing, so difficult, and so wrongly viewed by our middle and high school young ladies and beyond, but just using them as an example. And so a couple of things that I would point out to you, there was no shame in the garden, right? He, he uses that word specifically. At the end of Genesis chapter 2, when God brings Eve to Adam, it says that they were naked and unashamed, which is just an interesting statement. It's just, you know, the, 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 the Holy Spirit would put that recognition in there is, is of interest for a variety of reasons. But the first thing that I would say is this, understanding that in the garden before sin, there was no shame in any area. In any area, that would probably be one of the areas that has most become shameful since the fall of man. And in that time, there was no shame whatsoever. It was sin that brought shame to bear. And so my question that I would have for you is, is what view do you have about physical sexuality and how much of it has been shaped by the world and how much of it has been shaped by Scripture? Right. It, so much. And, and this so creeps in. And, and I hear this oftentimes in marriage counseling, where when all of a sudden everything starts breaking down and, and, and it's like, oh, fine, if you're going to talk about that, then I'm going to talk about this. And that happens quite often in my office. And when that happens, what I find very quickly is absolutely unbiblical views being used as weapons against one another in all areas of communication, finances and yes, uh, sexuality. Pretty quickly. And so what I want to ask is just for you all to think on this. God has given a beautiful gift in marriage that is unique to that. Therefore, it should be held in high esteem. Think about it in these terms, ladies. You have relationships that are very similar to the relationship with your husband in many, many areas. Meaning that you can have other people in your life, whether it be a boss or, or your parents who you respect and honor that you have a submission unto or have had a submission unto in your life. So you can be submitted unto someone else. You can have a closeness of, of care one for another with someone, another lady who is very dear to you, who will pray for you, 
who will help you, who will come alongside you, that you can bear your deepest struggles to and other things. So you can have an intimate relationship of closeness and communication with someone else. You can have someone that you receive financial counsel from and financial help even at times. That you can have conversations about your finances with. Whether it be a parent, someone else who's wise in the church. Of all the relationship things that you will have, this one of, of physical intimacy is the only one that is absolutely unique to your husband. Therefore, as that one thing that is different, set apart from anything else you ought to be experiencing with anyone else and guarded in that way, it should therefore be held in high esteem. But we live in a world where it isn't. We live in a world where it's not held in high esteem. And I don't simply mean that it's been perverted. I mean, it's been neglected and perverted. There's all kinds of ways that this can be abused. And all of them point back to a worldly mindset. To a, to a view that is tainted by the shame of sin and allows it to creep in in so many ways. So ask yourself, when you think through these things, when it comes to physical intimacy with your husband, I would encourage you, if you have a journal or something like that, write down, what do you actually believe God has said about this? How much of your view, of, if you were to, in talking to your closest confidant, another woman, and they were to ask you about this, and you were to bear... Just with transparency, this is what I think about it. How much of that would be worldly and how much of it would be biblical? It's a great question on any area, but most especially this area to be asking. Physical intimacy without shame. It goes on and says this right in the middle. But if marriage is so great, if everything I'm saying is true, and this is a question I get quite a bit, if marriage is so great, why does God have to exhort young women to love their husbands in Titus 2? Why do godly older women need to train younger women to love their husbands? Doesn't it come naturally for them to practice God's pattern for marriage? Doesn't it? I mean, we're created in God's image. This is his design for us. Doesn't it just instinctively flow out of us? And the answer is no. The answer is no. He gives the example of the specific marriages on Crete. But then he jumps to and, and rightly points to our cultural climate of sexual promiscuity, feminism, machismo, spousal abuse, and a high divorce rate. We have just as much need for God to call us to like our spouses and become likable in our relationships, to be taught these things, to, to be exhorted in them. He, he goes on into the next page, page 74. He says, basically he's saying at the top of page 74 that mainstream media, the world at large, produces or promotes very clearly a worldly view of, of marriage, of, of relationship, of, of men and women in, in relationship. And we see that very clearly. And then he says this, and I, and I want you to, to hear this right above, accept God's priority of a spouse, that last sentence. It says that because you are getting flooded with influence constantly and continually that you don't even think about from the music that's maybe you don't listen to it in your car, but I'll tell you, I, I was blessed this week. I went Easter dress shopping with my wife. It was our, our Saturday or Friday. I don't remember which morning we went, but I'm sitting in Macy's while she's trying dresses on and I'm taking some notes on some other things and working on just different things for the weekend ahead. And all of a sudden I'm like, what is that song saying? And then I realized what it was saying. I was like, Oh my goodness. Uh, that's, so influences are constantly bombarding us that we don't even realize the world is loud, right? The world is loud in promoting its viewpoint and you are not immune to it. No one is. And even if you've grown in maturity, if you're not teaching the younger generation, I guarantee the 13 year old girls that are walking through there are not immune to it. And what was even more shocking is I'm listening to the music and as I'm looking at the dresses that are available to the 13 year old young ladies, there's no doubt that the world is pushing an agenda. Therefore, we have to be those who are careful to put up right and clear truth so that we can avoid being influenced by that. He says this, that's why it is so important to be reading and meditating on scripture. There's so much of this. I've had people say to me, well, your church really just seems to say, that if we just read our Bible every day, everything will be okay. 
Yep, pretty much. <laughs> With some obvious truth of caveats that are in there, but yes. If you are a believer, this is your food. This is your sustenance. This is your lamp and light that protects you from, from all that is out there. This is your strength. This is described as that which, when you put it inside of you, keeps you from sinning against the Lord. There is such a gift in this. And this is what will paint clear lines and guard you from worldliness creeping in and all the ways the world is striving to bring it to bear. And believe me when I tell you, the world is not slacking and striving to influence each of you in here, much less the younger ones. And so there's a major need for this. We do this so that our minds can be renewed by God's truth, particularly about marriage. Marriage is under attack. Make no mistake, marriage is under attack. And are we winning? Just out of curiosity, I mean, do you, do you look around? Do you, do you think we're winning? We're not winning. This is a conversation I had with our deacons the other day. And um, why are we so busy? Right? Why is this church so busy doing conferences on marriage and conferences on manhood and conferences on womanhood and, and, and it work days where we gather and just a variety of things, Wednesday night, midweek services and home groups and, and other things. Why are we so busy? Because Ephesians 5 says with all clarity, we're to make the most of our time because the days are evil. Period. That's it. We're to make the most of our time because the days are evil. There's not a, a waking hour of your life. The world's not seeking to influence you. Whether it's through the music that's coming through the speakers where, in the store you're in. Whether it's the, the people you're driving by. Whether it's your flesh being drawn to their inability to drive that wants to cause you to speak in a certain way. Whatever it is, the world is constantly promoting and pursuing and pushing influence upon you and your children. On the next generation. So there has to be something that protects, that washes that dirt off, so to speak. And, and we're told what it is. So there is a major need for us to be those who are examining and renewing our minds. What do you believe? Do you know what you believe about specific things? Marriage, abortion, finances, submission, specific components of marriage, uh, physical intimacy. Do you know what you believe about issues like, like gender? Do you know, or is it just a tradition? Let me give you an example. Can anyone give me a moral argument for why it's worse for a same-sex couple who have been in a committed relationship for 10 plus years to adopt a child than for a heterosexual couple who are in a disaster of a relationship that has the police involved in other things and is constantly filled with immorality and, and other pursuits outside of their relationship. Can anyone give me a moral argument? Because those are the kind of questions you're going to be asked. Now I can give you a biblical one all day long and it won't be well received. You won't win that argument, so to speak, because they're not going to receive the Bible. But it's the only truth I have that doesn't change. And so we have to stand on these things. So that would be a major thing is, do you know what you actually believe on these areas? On page 74, <clears throat> he comes to the second point, accept God's priority of a spouse. Now, God commanded young women to love their husbands for the older women to teach them this. And he commanded that young women are to do this. Sorry. <clears throat> when he did that, he didn't do that apart from pure and perfect and complete knowledge. Right. God did not give that command and then look down and say, oh, my goodness, I said that, but I forgot how bad so and so is. And, and so with her husband behaving the way he is, then that command, she, she's exempt from that because she won't be blessed by it. God has perfect knowledge, but he also has given perfect provision. When he, when he says that, the author tells us in page 74, he knows that you have his grace working in your heart, that you are filled and empowered by the Spirit, that you are motivated by the example of Christ, that you want to obey his word from your heart. 
that you desire to be an effective witness for Christ and you have his glory as your highest goal. That this is the realities of what it means that you're a Christian. That this is, this is not your marriage. This is your relationship with the Lord. And then flowing out of that comes all things from motherhood to marriage to every other endeavor that you're pursuing in. He says this, loving your husband is listed first in the essential qualities, and it must be first in the heart, mind, and priorities of a wife. And he gives this picture, which I think is pretty interesting. He says, these qualities assume that you have a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. And in bold on page 75, he says, think about it in these terms. No one can say they love the Lord without liking the Lord relationally. Can you imagine making that statement about Christ? I love you, Jesus. I just don't like you right now. Like that's so outside the realm of what we should ever think. In the same way, it should apply to the overflow of the things Christ has given us. If we're commanded to, in relationship, love our spouses, then that love ought to bear with it the same view that we have of Christ. Because that's what he continually tells us, right? Ladies, you're to live with your husbands according to your relationship that you have with Christ. And he tells husbands the same thing in Ephesians 5. It's, it's the picture of your relationship with Christ is the foundation for your relationship with your husband. Let me put it in different terms that might be even a little bit more helpful, even though it might be more troubling. The way in which you are living with your husband is a reflection of the true realities of your heart's view towards Christ. Right? The, the way that you're living, according to Ephesians 5, the way that you live with your husband is a true reflection of how you view Christ at the heart level. Because it's the overflow of your relationship with Christ that carries itself over into your relationship with your husband. That's the picture Ephesians 5 gives. And so the author rightly says, no one can say they love the Lord without liking the Lord relationally. He goes on, he says this at the bottom of the page on 75, the last sentence that goes over to the next one. Loving the Lord means that you will have a right relationship with your husband, which includes both liking and loving him. And this is so important. Loving the Lord means, results in, leaves no room for error, that you will have a right relationship with your husband, which includes both liking and loving him, because... If you are not, if you are a follower of Christ who have been saved by his grace and you are not liking and loving your husband, you are in disobedience to your Lord. And so this relationship drives this relationship. That's one of the things we did at a marriage conference a couple of years ago in explaining this has to be right for this to be right. And your individual relationship here is an essential component of anything that you're going to be able to do uh, with, within your home or your spouse or your children and vice versa, right? This relationship that you have this way is a constant sanctifier that's pointing us to the relationship we have that way that we put our hopes there. Because if you think that he's calling you to put your hopes in your husband or your children, that would be foolish. He's calling you to put your hope in him and him alone. And when that hope is rightly rooted and grounded there then you get to experience the overflow of that into every other area if you start putting your hope in your husband you'll find very quickly why that will not work and the same thing with husbands if they're looking to their wife to be their satisfaction and contentment they'll find very quickly why that will not work on that page 76 he says paul tells titus that teaching women to like their husbands is first on god's list and he makes this, this recognition, no career, no school, no ministry, no child, no parent, no boss or goal should ever stand in the way of the love relationship between a wife and a husband. Ladies, I'll, I'll tell you this. What's probably the number one area on there within, within the church that becomes a hindrance to the relationship with, the, with, your, with your husband? Children. Children. Absolutely. That is one I'm constantly helping to see more biblically and continually in those things. It's not usually at the level of you who are gathered here on a Wednesday night, careers or other things. It's almost without exception, children. And so here's a statement that my wife coined some time ago that I think is absolutely clear and accurate. She summarized so much of what I'm striving to teach. 
She said, you're not building a a life with your children. You're not called to. You're called to raise your children so they can go out and mature and build a life with someone else. You are building a life with your spouse. And it's good to remember that. It's good to be reminded of those truths. You are not called to build a life with your children. You are called, commanded to build a life with your spouse. Now, this doesn't negate loving your children. It doesn't negate raising them. It doesn't negate any of those things. But it means that we have to keep those clearly before us and rightly seen. He goes on and says this. Here are four questions to ask yourself. I thought this was really good. If you are seeking to build biblical habits that will serve your marriage for a lifetime, does your husband get your best or the leftovers? And if you say the leftovers, then ask yourself, who gets your best? And you know right away what you need to work on. What are the areas you need to correct? Do you make things special for your husband or are your actions towards him routine? Well, everyone else, children, friends, parents, church, get the special treatment. Number three, do you work hard at trying to please him? And number four, does your husband work harder in the marriage than you do? These are just good questions for examination. Remember this, your loving your husband is an expression of loving the Lord. If you love the Lord and you're not doing these four things well, the Lord has called you to, to do them well. Out of your love for Him, strive in these areas. The next thing is feel God's passion for your spouse. This is such an important thing. As he walks through this, uh, he deals with a little bit with the Greek, and, and we know that there's three different words, eros, phileo, and agape, that are used for love at different times. Uh, and he's very clear in helping us understand that. Uh, the Greek word phileo, uh, the Greek verb, starting at page 76, is the word used here uh, at the top of page 77, sorry. And at its root, and speaks of a love that cherishes with tender affection. It is the love of relationship sharing communication and friendship you are to not only love your husband but you're also to like him like that's what the phileo love would would display itself in is a genuine friendship right that that should be the goal the aim of your pursuit of marriage will it come up short of course Of course, there's a measure of dependency upon the Lord, and we'll look at that in a moment, but but that should be the goal. Anytime that's not there, you should recognize, this needs to be rectified. This needs to be corrected. This needs to be, why would I want to experience something less? Why would I want to go through life viewing my husband and being viewed by my spouse in such a way that makes it a difficulty when God gave it for for my joy and happiness, not for my misery? And it doesn't have to be that. Listen to to the things he he goes on and says. Why do so many Christians miss this responsibility and blessing? Because you and I can easily drift from an internally motivated love to an external empty routine or self-centered love. We can let our schedule drive our obedience rather than our heart commitment. This can also happen between us and God. We let the daily routine run our lives and forget that Christianity is a love relationship. Many Christians, listen to this, have the outward appearance of being obedient to God and do all that's required of them without remaining tender-hearted toward Christ. Those who do this may appear spiritual, but if they continue with only an external faith, they are those who have lost their first love. If it can happen with Christ... I promise it can happen with your husband. If it can happen with Christ, it can happen with your husband. He says that a marriage relationship can also drift into that same kind of sad mediocrity, eroding from love to mere duty. That's why it gives us this picture of wives. You have to love your husbands. Older women are to teach the younger women to do this. Why did Paul put that in there? Why was that such an essential component through the power of the Spirit that this would be included to a young pastor and how to best care for the church. Because this is something that we all have to gear up for. It's not something that's going to only affect 10%. It affects all of us. We're all subject to, we're all prone. None are those who are not themselves capable 
of slipping into any of these traps. He goes on and says this. You do what is required with an outward obedience, but inwardly your heart is no longer tender and affectionate toward your spouse. You may even sink to a level where you no longer like him. And then I want you to listen to this. You must learn how to continue to appreciate him as a best friend, a lover, a provider, a leader, as someone you continually cherish. I love that he puts that word in there. You must learn. That's what Titus 2 is about. Helping you to learn how to do the things that you desire to do, but that don't come naturally. That's the picture of what's here. It's not an emotion. It's not how you feel. It's what you do. And the doing is often that which requires help. And God is so kind that he gives this command, but then he gives the help to the accomplishment of it because he is the one who has given us everything pertaining to life and to godliness. He's given what's needed. He gives some possible indicators of whether you like your husband, in case you're not sure. I kind of felt like most would know the answer to this. But I do think these are good examination points. And he said, if you're single, you can pray and plan for the future as you read them, that you would yourself be guarded from these happening. Mm -hmm. Here's just some basic things. Do you greet him at the door? Do your eyes light up when you see him? Do you laugh at his jokes even when they're not that funny? Do you cheer him on when he is in a competition? Do you hold his hand, show affection, give gifts, and surprise him unexpectedly? Do you make time to, communi to communicate and connect heart to heart? I added two more. Do you hold him in high esteem and guard his reputation in the way in which you speak about him? And then this one, do others know that you are his and he is yours? Do others know that? Is that something that, that's known in the circles in which you travel in, in the circles of friends and church and families? Do, do they know that absolutely, without equivocation, that he is yours and you are his? This should be clear to all who know you. And that's an... A wonderful point if those things aren't what they ought to be, begin to pray and work on them. Find someone who is in a marriage that does have not perfection, but is displaying this and, and ask, what, do, what am I lacking? What do I need to do? What does that look like? What should I expect? Because it is given to you and commanded to you to love your husbands in this way. He goes on on page 78. The answers to these questions can identify, identify whether a woman likes her husband. But then he says this, developing, hear that word? It's not the work of a moment. This isn't something that you're going to go home tonight and you're going to somehow figure out how to accomplish everything that's lacking and, and tomorrow everything's going to be perfect and, and forever. That's just not true. And it's never been given in that way. This is a work. It is, it is a labor. Developing this kind of love will require. You won't be able to figure it out on your own. Do you know why that is? In a fleshly way, do you know why this is something you can't figure out on your own? Because you're two sinners. You go and try and talk to your husband about what you need from him, and he tries to talk to you about what he needs from you, and before long, you're going to be in an argument. Because you're two sinners. That's just real because you're looking at it saying, well, I don't think I should give that if you're not willing to give this. And I don't think this. And, I, and he's going to be saying the same thing. And does anyone know how to push your buttons more than him? Does anyone know how to push his buttons more than you? It's just the truth of who we are. And that's why God says you're going to need some mentoring from a godly older woman. Someone of the same sex as you that's been there and, and has faced these things and has a husband in their life that pushes her buttons and that she's learned through discipline and self-control to overcome those things. You are going to need that to love your husbands, to be liked and to be likable uh, or to like love and be liked is going to require godly mentoring uh, in the design God's given. God can sanctify your heart to love in this way. Is God prone to, on the pages of Scripture, 
do things that are outside of his commands or in opposition to his commands. That's not his pattern. It's not his pattern. There are times when God seems to, in spite of certain things, act in, in, in areas of patience and long suffering to a greater degree than other times. But generally speaking, if you're saying, God, I want to love my husband, but I don't want no older woman speaking into my life, then it's very unlikely that you will ever, by God's strength, love him as you ought. Does it make sense? You in your own strength can't do this. You need God's strength. Well, God is not going to lend his strength to one who's in grave and continual disobedience to the commands he's given. That's not how he most often works in Scripture. And none of us should ever have confidence or hope that somehow you're going to be the exception to that rule. And, and when he does work that way, by the way, it's never really pleasant. Think Jonah. Right? Think, Joe, oh, you're going to do, even though you don't want to do, I'm going to make you do. You don't really want that relation, your relationship with the Lord to look in that light. So if you want to please the Lord by loving your husbands, as scripture commands, you're going to require, you're going to need Titus to realities in your life. God can change your heart to love him and apply grace and forgiveness. That's the thing. I've had a lot of ladies say, I just, I think my marriage is too far gone. I don't, I don't think I can get it back. I don't, I don't know if I can ever forgive. I don't know if, if he can ever forgive me. I don't know if this is the best that we can do is basically what we've settled into. And my answer is with God, all things are possible. He gave these truths. We are relying upon him for the fulfillment of them. If you think in your own strength, you're going to suddenly start to love, forgive, and like your husband, then no. You're seeing this completely wrongly. But if you're relying on God for it, he is able, he is able to do that work in your marriage. But he does not do that work in marriages that are dishonoring him and not in obedience to him. At least not in a pleasant way to the marriage or to the individuals in it. And so remember that God can chance why we are obedient to God because we trust him. Oh, God, I, I do. I, I got married because I, I want to love my husband. I want him to love me. I want to have a friendship with him. I want to I do well, God. That's why I got married. How do I do that? Lord, help me to do that. And he says, I did. I did. I gave you this design of godly older women to help you to do these things. That's why it's so important that our, our older women are rightly seeing it or being available to and desiring to help with the younger women who are in the midst of it. He goes on and uses this word at the bottom of page 78 at the, at the heading, pursue God's plan to be likable. It's work. We have this mentality in our generation that we want for all of our sanctification to happen while we sleep. Right? We want all of our sanctification to be accomplished without us doing anything to the accomplishment of it. Right? We, just, we, we want to not have to read and grow in knowledge. We want to uh, not have to fight sin and grow in purity and, and holiness. We want to not have to learn to love our husbands or our spouses and somehow magically love them more. And that doesn't, it never happens that way. That's why you have to pursue God's plan in this. As you seek, page 78, the very bottom, as you seek to become a more likable person, you will make it easier for him to like you and vice versa. Oh, this is the hardest part, right? Because our flesh demands what? Well, if he wants this for me, he better start doing some of it on his own. Isn't that our flesh? I can tell you it's your husband's flesh, right? I can speak definitively from that, that there's a measure of, you know, I'd like to lead her, but if I try and lead her, oh my goodness, life's miserable for the next month and I'm not sure it's worth it. And what he's saying is I don't want to do the work of leadership. I want to, I want to lay aside my commands from God on behalf of my comfort. And I want to make my whole role in marriage to where I'm the victim in this. Well, in the same way, wives are subject to doing the same things because y'all are sinners too. You all have the same flesh or influenced by the same worldly things. It's different because you're women. You have different roles, different designs by God, but it's the same outcomes. Well, I, I, my husband doesn't deserve this kind of treatment for me. 
you don't know how unfunny his jokes are. You want me to laugh at them? Right? It's the general nature of how we react in this. And so I want us to understand that as you seek to, and this is always, I'm, I'm constantly laboring. I'll tell you this. I've had multiple young men tell me this. They'll come to me early in the marriage. And they'll, say, they'll say a lot of things, but this particular thing, they'll say something to the effect of, I, it's just so hard. And I'm like, what does that mean? And like, I'm convinced that if, when we have a disagreement, uh, I forget the word one of them used. It was a wonderful word. It was uh, sanctified discussion, which by that he meant argument. <laughs> when, we, when we have a sanctifying discussion, that at the end of it, if I don't say and seek reconciliation, then we would never have reconciliation, that she would just be okay with never being reconciled. And I said, well, what does that mean? He says, it means that I always have to say I'm sorry first. And my response to him was, welcome to leadership. <laughs> right? That is a nature and an essence of what God's given us in this. But at the same time, ladies, I want you to understand this. If your goal is oneness, if your goal is partnership, and that's your desire, and you find yourself where you're like this, somebody's got to start. Right? Somebody has to. And it's very rare that in moments when it's like this, that they both in the relationship are like, oh, yeah, we messed up. Let's fix this. Right? It's, that's not how it is. Usually someone has to start and say, you know what? I, I don't like this. Hey. 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 Right? That's how that works. And so in the same way, yes, it should be him. And, and he is being commended in that. But it should also be you because you yourself desire oneness in relationship is all as well. You have to pursue this. And this flows out of the same picture you're given. Look at the top of page 79. A passionate desire to be like Jesus. I love this statement. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. Unless you have a passionate desire to be like Jesus, no amount of outward works will make you a godly woman. And so here's some things that I would say you can do, and he lists them out. I think these are wonderful examinations. We're called to examine ourselves. This is a wonderful, seek accountability in these. Find someone who will tell you the truth in this area that you'll listen to and, and be transparent with them. This is my struggle. This is what I'm struggling with. Can, can you help me with it? And then be ready to be confronted. Because why would someone be okay with you living in your sin when they know that sin destroys? And so they're not. So number one, check your reputation. Check your reputation. You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all the time. <coughs> this is something I would commend you to. Find someone that you interact with regularly and ask them to hold you accountable in the areas you know you struggle. Someone that you can trust will in fact do that. It's such an important component of, of life. That this needs to be, I would, and by the way, don't ask like every three years. This isn't like the Jubilee feast or anything like that. This is ask regularly because sin will grab you quicker and take you further faster than you ever thought possible. And once it gets you rolling, it's harder to stop. Keep a short receipt. Ask, well, what, what is my reputation? How, how am I seen? How do you see me? What do you think when you see me coming? Do you think, uh oh, I'm about to hear some complaining? Do you think, uh-oh, I'm, I'm about to get steamrolled. This person going to tell me everything that's wrong but not hear anything that's right. What is the reputation that you have? Find someone who will tell you the truth. And this is something I'll encourage you in. On two fronts, so many times people want to point to the moment and say, but that's not how I really meant that or those things. Listen, our lives are a movie role. They're not a snapshot. Remember that. That is such a helpful reality in so many ways. That means if you have been maintaining a solid reputation and you have a moment or when you have a moment and you will, it's just a snapshot. It's not the definer of who you are. But in the same way, if the pattern of your life and the movie that goes with it is one of, of sinful rebellion and those things, and then you want to stand upon the snapshot that wasn't that way, that doesn't work either. Our life is not a snapshot. It's a movie. Remember that truth as you're considering these things and, and holding up. Check your reputation. Check your appearance. <sighs> you know, 
I started to give this to Ransom, but I, I like him too much. If ever there's an area that will create struggles within a church, it's in the area of modesty. Why? Why is that? I think a couple of reasons. I think number one, uh, it's an area that the world has already brought great influence to bear. I think number two, it's an area that most often people will feel, well, you have your definition and I have mine. Uh, I have, I believe that this is modest, but you know, if I lived in the African rainforest, I'd wear much less clothing. I'm like, well, but you don't live in the African rainforest, therefore that doesn't really apply, does it? Right? That's not the nature of these things. And so all of this always creates struggle, and it really shouldn't. And I think he does a great job with this check your appearance. The way you dress tells you something about your heart. It's a wonderful tale or tattletale on, on what you're viewing. Check your heart and check your motives. What are some of the motives uh, that, that stands out? Well, what are you trying to uh, accomplish with your dress? We don't have time tonight, but in, in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2 is one of the areas where he speaks in terms of tell the women to be modest. And he's speaking in terms of how the church ought to function. Now, it's not just about in the church, but he says very specifically, and it's that passage he deals with the braiding of hair and the wearing of gold things. And there's two basic things. When you come to church, you come to worship the Lord. And there are two basic things that generally about, a way, about the way a woman dresses that will cause distraction to your brothers and sisters who are striving to worship the Lord. One of them is if you're immodest, there will be distraction, right? And it won't just be the men, but it will predominantly be towards the men. And number two, if you are displaying or flaunting with the idea of I want to gain attention because of my wealth, because of my style, because of those things, then that will distract the ladies, right? And so what Paul is saying to Timothy is, is tell the women to dress in such a way that the worship of the Lord striving to be accomplished is not hindered by their dress. Very simple, right? The braiding of hair was a great costly uh, endeavor in that day. There were multiple other things. So we don't have time to get into all that, but this is what I want us to understand. What we wear, especially what ladies wear, let's just be clear. It's not that men themselves cannot be immodest. It's that basically, by the design that God has given, men struggle more fully with women who are immodest than women struggle with men who are immodest. I'm not making that as an excuse. I'm not saying, therefore, the greater burden lays on you. I'm simply saying this is a reality of creation that has to be taken into account and consideration. There's a couple things, and he does a great point, and he says this. There's a difference between being attractive and being alluring. When scripture describes things that ought not to be as it pertains to relationship and other things, it deals with adultery, homosexuality, uh, fornication. It deals with all manners of immorality, but where it also deals with in the term or under the heading of the same word group of immorality is this term sensuality. And it tells us that we're to avoid sensuality, that we're to have nothing to do with it, that we're not to in any way participate in the things of the world in those areas. And so it's an important thing to consider and that we want to teach the next generation. He says this, when people uh, look at your social media page presence, do they see a page that points to you or a page that points to Christ? What's the motive of your heart in all arenas? The woman who really loves the Lord will dress with the motive of trying to honor Christ with her appearance. That's a big deal. Is that your motive when you consider the dress, whatever the dress is? Um, this is a major difference in, in our view of relationship uh, from a worldly versus a godly perspective. Uh, one of the things I'm constantly working on in helping young people in, in their understanding of, of dating and the godly design versus the worldly is that, well, very simply to deal with the issue of modesty, that's basically the greatest way that the world teaches a young woman to gain the attention of a young man. Mm -hmm. And what I'm constantly trying to help them understand, even not me so much, my wife more so, and the other ladies of this church, but me in a shepherding sense, is that if, if you win a man with your body, you won't like your prize, Right? If that's what you've won him with, you, you won't like the prize you've won. 
And that's such an important thing. When we think in terms, so I'm constantly, when, when couples start dating and other things and they ask, well, what does this look like? And I'm like, you need to guard each other's hearts. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> and the basic simple thing is, okay, obviously you, you probably kind of like each other and attract each other. We're not trying to hide that. The simplest way I would put it is this. You showing to the young lady or to the young man that you like them, totally acceptable. You doing things to try and make them like you, totally worldly. It's the manipulation that is constantly being pressed in upon. And it has nothing to do with trusting in the Lord. It has nothing to do with seeking after the Lord. It has all the opposites of that, of leaning on your own strength in those things. And it's it's ugly. Uh, the worldly view of dating is you want to hide the real you so that they'll actually like you. The biblical view of dating is that you want to be as open, transparent, honest as possible and see if they'll like you for who you are. Right? Well, there's a good foundation for, for a lifetime. And it's such a different one than what the world gives us. All right, we've got to hurry. Like I said, I'm going to be in, in trouble. Uh, check your focus, bottom of page 80. A godly woman may have many responsibilities, but she'll have a singular focus. And this is that 1 Corinthians 10.31 truth that we look at in our understanding of the, of the first non-negotiable for the church. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all of it to the glory of God. In the midst of all they do, godly women will want to bring glory to God, to point to him and to make him look good. This priority will show through when they talk, work, play, drive, watch entertainment, surf the internet and live every day daylight and so he asked this question and i think it's a good one he says how does this make her look more likable how does everything we've just looked at make her more likable in her marriage and he says this when you desire to be like jesus and show it in your actions your life becomes a sweet aroma he goes on and says this in, in the middle of page 81 when you live with a passionate desire to be like jesus you will be a sweet aroma to others genuine born-again believers are not crusty they are cheerful they are not depressing, but delight, delightful to be around. And he goes on and says this, a disciplined and dependent lifestyle. You've heard the old saying, don't pray for patience. I, I disagree. I think we should pray for patience. We need it all the time. It's something we should grow in because we so desperately need it. This year, Pastor Ransom convinced me to join him in praying for greater recognition of dependency. That's way more dangerous than praying for patience, I have learned. Praying for a greater, we are dependent, but we tend to not recognize it well. And so we've been praying for a greater recognition of dependency, a disciplined and dependent life. This is a woman who he says at page 81, she grows disciplined in her walk with Christ as she daily depends upon the power of the spirit. This is the only way she's able to love and like her husband and become more likable in his eyes. If you're not looking to the Lord first and said you're looking to yourself or to him, you're ready for failure. But if you can do this and then look at him, have him look at the Lord first and then at you. That's why I always tell, push your husband to the Lord. If, if a husband, I'm always telling them, push your wife to the Lord. This woman has learned the discipline of practicing Galatians 5.16. She seeks, there's that labor again, to walk by the Spirit and refrain from carrying out the desires of the flesh. An empowered walk comes from learning the disciplines of moment-by-moment moment dependence upon the Holy Spirit by keeping your eyes focused on Jesus, learning to pray without ceasing, and meditating on the Word of God. She will seek after Him every moment of every day, confessing her sin and yielding her life to Him. How does this make you likable? Top of page 82. How does this make you likable? When you develop the disciplines of a Christ-like lifestyle and seek each day to be filled with the Spirit, then your personality, words, attitudes, and actions will produce a special kind of fruit. This is what's called the fruit of the Spirit. What kind of fruit do you produce? And I want you to think about it in this term. Think about if you have a daughter and she's single, or, or some of the single ladies of our church, and, and, and how we love and care for them. And I want you to think about what type of man these different fruits would produce or would, would attract? Think about this. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, and carousing. What type of man is that fruit going to attract? And you might say, well, you know, it's only three out of the ten. It's still the same fruit. 
it's still going to attract the same things. These are the works of the flesh. Or think about this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Ladies, I would just say to you that to the right man, those are lovely. To the right man, to the man that we want, the ladies of our church who are single, to our daughters who are coming up, that we want them to attract, to, to be in relationship with, that type of fruit will attract the right man. And he will find it lovely. Uh, the last one, 82. Is there choir practice tonight? We got four minutes, so hang on. Demanding our rights is the way of our society, but giving up our rights is the way of God. This is part of what we've kind of inherited in our American culture, is this idea that, that by God's grace, we get to demand our rights. Right? I'm owed this. Because I was, by God, born an American, and I have a constitution, and therefore, because of that, I am, I am owed these things. And that's crept into the church, where I now have many, many church services that are based upon a declaration of the rights that are afforded us in this country, much more so than the fruits of the Spirit that are ours in Christ. The example that Christ has set for us to recognize this. Now, I am not saying that it's not by God's providence that we were born where we were, and that... That constitution is part of what has given us these things that we ought to preserve according to being born in this nation through, through the process of voting and other things that we're given. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying very simply is if all of that's gone, Christ is still worthy. If all of that's gone, it doesn't change one iota of what I'm called to be and do. So I don't want to make my obedience to the Lord dependent upon my rights being afforded me or else I'm setting myself up for some really dangerous areas in the eternal sense and the spiritual sense of things and so we need to recognize that very easily how much that has crept into the church's view into our view of life demanding our rights is the way of our society but giving up our rights is the way of God you'll, you'll see this continually and he gives multiple examples we don't have time to look at them individually but he says this on page 83. Again, this goes back to how does this make us likable? Well, someone who is truly submissive will not create strife nor contention. Consider these warnings from Proverbs. It is better to live in the corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. It is better to live in a desert land than with a contentious, strife-filled, and vexing or angry woman. A constant dripping on a day of steady rain and a contentious woman are alike. And so he goes on. God is obviously saying at the top of page 84 that an angry, strife-filled, non-submissive, rebellious woman is not likable. But how does he speak in terms of a submissive wife? He calls her a treasure. Proverbs 31.10, an excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above pearls. A godly woman is likable because she has a heart to meet needs and help others. Proverbs 31.20 says she extends her hand to the poor and stretches out her hands to the needy. And Proverbs 31.27 says she watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. I'll end with this because we just don't have time. I would encourage you to read the rest of it. It's only another page and a half. Um, but this is an important thing. Consider this contrast. Proverbs 31 speaks in this way. Proverbs 7 speaks of the other type of a lady. Compare the two. Look at Proverbs 31. Look at Proverbs 7. This is one verse I picked out from Proverbs 11. Or Proverbs 7, verse 11. She is boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. Lady, there's a lot to be said for being content. For being satisfied with, with what the Lord has given you. And laboring in the Proverbs 31 sense to make a home that is as all that God has intended. This is beautiful. This is a treasure. And this is God who has given these things. So I just want to encourage you all, look at those contrasts and understand with the major question being, do you know what you believe? Especially about marriage. Can you define it biblically and then point to your life as a reflection of that pray with me lord we are thankful for your provision lord without it we would be lost in the truest sense of the word lord lost and damned but lord even as those who are redeemed we would still be those who are lost in the midst of 
the unruliness of our flesh and the rebellion of the world around us, Lord, we would, even as you're redeemed, be overwhelmed by these things if it were not for your gift of, of your spirit to uh, give us new life, to convict us of sin, to do all of the work uh, of encouragement and exhortation that you have promised. And a major part of that work is that he has given us your word, both uh, through the, the breathing, breathing or the inspiration of it and through the understanding of it. And so, Lord, I, I thank you for these gifts. I pray for, for our church uh, as the men and women are striving to grow in these things. And I pray especially tonight for the ladies in this room. Lord, that, that your spirit, according to your word, would be empowering to them uh, in the areas that need to change, that they would repent, that they would turn from them and, and, and turn to you and your truth and faith, trusting in it to do the work that you have promised. And in areas that they are doing well and striving, Lord, I pray that you would strengthen them and bind them together with their husbands, bring their husbands to these same truths so that they will have a true partnership. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.